being someone that's been in been in this industry for a while and always had to answer questions about what uh, what goes on and everything, I've, I've developed a bit of a dark side to to uh, my personality. That I've got people that know me. I have some sometimes dark sense of humor, and uh, I said one of the. People have always questioned me, they wonder about what happens and how long the prions last. And I've always kind of jokingly said, I said, well, I'd rather I'd rather deal with nuclear waste, at least I know how long that, that lasts. Um, anyway, our, uh, our next presentation is uh, going to deal with that. We're going to find out some things about prion and how long it lasts, and for that we'll bring up the... Uh, Dr. Judd Aiken, and he's going to enlighten us on what he's discovered. Uh, get a little closer to the mic. Oh boy. Now, I have a problem here, and in that I tend to wander, and I tend to move. So I will, I will do my best to hang tight and close to this, to this microphone. Uh, other problem I've got is it's after lunch. And therefore, if you're a speaker that tends to put people to sleep and you give people an after lunch session as well, that's kind of a double dynamic that isn't, uh, isn't good. I think I'm okay. Are we, we okay? Um, also, as I'm going, I, I'm, I'm married. I'm used to being interrupted. So don't hesitate if you've got a question or if something's not making sense, you can call me and I can. Uh, okay. Here's my contact information, judd.aken at ualberta.ca will get a hold of me. If the first email you send me doesn't happen, send a second polite one. If that doesn't work, then send the damn it, Judd, please respond email. Usually that does work. Um, this is a danger thing. I, I grabbed this slide. It's not part of my talk, but it was something that was discussed earlier. I haven't looked at this slide in well over a month. It's from Brian Richards. But basically what it's showing here is from the CWD endemic region, um, where there's high prevalence of CWD in deer in Wisconsin, they clearly know where the hunters are coming from and the potential for carcasses to get moved from CWD endemic area. And keep in mind in Wisconsin, in this area that's, that's shown in yellow there, we're talking 50% of the bucks are positive for the disease. Um, you can see where and the potential for trouble here. Um, I think this is not part of my talk, but I had this slide and I thought it was 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 relevant. Um, so where I'm what I'm going to do with this talk, and I, and I really appreciate the excellent talks that went on earlier. A few of these slides I've got I can go over a little quicker because the background has already been done. I'm going to briefly talk about um, the lab that I'm co-runner with, along with my wife, Dr. Debbie McKenzie. Um, give a bit of background, and most of the focus here on the CWD will be on environmental factors and how that relates. Um, uh, clearly we'll be talking about environmental persistence of prions, evidence we have for that. Show you a little data that we're generating on uh, interaction of CWD prions with vegetation, why we're doing that. CWD soil interaction, soil minerals, humic acids, and then interpretations, because although I'm going to be arguing humic acid can degrade, we are not at a point where I'm at all arguing we should be applying humic acids to fields yet. I think this is way too preliminary. About 10 years ago, I was contacted by Dave Westaway from the University of Alberta. I we had been at University of Wisconsin for 20 some years prior to that, but they were setting up a facility in Edmonton. And the cool thing about this was, uh, Deb and I had sort of been sort of the lone rangers at the University of Wisconsin, really the only prion disease people there anymore. And this was an opportunity to work with other prion disease experts 
It was also an opportunity to work at a facility. It's expensive doing this stuff in that we have a lot of requirements as far as regulations, et cetera. So you need specialized facilities to work with brands. That was being developed. Um, and so we quite happily made the jump from Madison, Wisconsin, to Edmonton about 10 years ago. My mom, who lives in Wisconsin, was not too happy about it. Had a couple grandkids yanked out from under her, but at any rate, uh, Creon's side of life in the Aiken McKenzie lab, uh, my side of the lab works on environmental persistence, interaction of prions with soil. I'll give you some of that. Deb works, and, and Glenn gave a good background on this, on prion disease strains. Um, one of the factors with prion, prion disease strains is we've got a number of cervid species in Alberta that have CWD, so the potential as this disease moves from species to species and back again is that there is the potential to, to generate uh, novel prion diseases, CWD strains that we haven't seen before. Uh, we have a lab, um, a moderately sized lab, two graduate students, Elizabeth and Anthony, uh, two technicians, a number of senior staff, and this is a really, really well-trained and very, very good group. I'm going to be mentioning now Sue Kuznosova, who's uh, a soil scientist by training, and uh, some of her work will be presenting later on. Much of this I don't need to cover. I'm through mink on this as well, transmissible mink encephalopathy. It was something um, my mentor at the University of Wisconsin, Lake Richard Marsh, devoted his career to. We haven't seen TME in a few decades, a few decades now. Um, as noted by Glenn, we know the camel form of the disease, dromedary form, and I do want to emphasize that virtually all of our studies that I'm showing are work that are done with transgenic mice that are susceptible to CWD. I fully realize the importance of working in the real world as opposed to the lab world, um, but the initial studies have to be done in the lab. It's the only way to get large large number of animals, um, and, and the, the only way to get these studies initially done. Um, I don't know how much Glenn, it, it costs Glenn to, to run his animals. Some of these experiments I'm showing in mice were about $1,000 per experiment. We ran many, many years ago in Wisconsin a deer transmission study, 12 deer. I think the bill came to roughly $200,000 by the time four years of animal care in containment were done. So it's, it's a drastically different. If you're a wildlife disease person, and I appreciate you that, and we're coming up with these bad ideas for a wildlife <coughs> disease, chronic wasting disease would click darn near every, every box. Um, you first of all got it in a species that people care about. Be it, be it tourism, be it hunting, economically important species. Um, I've got caribou down there now. I mean, clearly we expect this disease to transmit to caribou. It, it's just a matter of time when the overlap between CWD as it's spreading overlaps with, with caribou. Is, but I guess for now, officially, the caribou are off, but I think that will change. Clearly, we've got a contagious breeding disease. We have no way of treating it, no cure, no, and it's always fatal. The animal lives long enough. We've got a related prion disease that's a known zoonotic, meaning that we know it can transmit to humans, ESE, the variant of Fredsville Yacht disease. Detection systems, as you've heard, are complicated, to say the least, because we're trying, we're distinguishing an abnormally structured form of something that all of us have. Strains we've covered. We know the disease agent can persist in the environment for years, probably decades. Long preclinical, man, this sucker has messed up. CWD, it has messed up. BSE, human forms, it, 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 that animals that are infected or humans that are infected with the disease appear perfectly healthy for most of the disease. 
and only at the end of the disease do they show clinical symptoms has, has been a major, major problem. We have a very nice, very nice talk on prion protein genetics. Maybe the only good news in all this is that it's not influenza-like as far as its spread. It's not measles-like in its spread. It's a very slow spreading, slow spreading disease. And to date, it appears to be confined to cervix. So I think the question marks are relevant for it. You've seen this. <clears throat> That's not good news. If you simply tally the number of states and provinces by year and give a cumulative total, it's also a very disturbing trend. Though part of this trend is obviously who's looking and how hard, but clearly that trend is quite relevant. And as noted, we can now add Sweden to the list as of a couple days ago now um, in, in Northern Europe. So, and this was already mentioned. I'm wondering why I need to be up here because most of everything I'm saying has been already mentioned today, but it's already been mentioned today that with CWD transmission, we get animal to animal, direct transmission, but very clearly an important route here is animal to environment to animal. And I want to make sure I'm very clear on one thing. In no place am I, with, with soil transmission, am I talking some sort of um, de novo, magical, magical jumping out of the soil prions. This is a case where infected animals have released infectivity into the environment, and that shed infectivity persists and can be a source of infectivity to naive, naive animals. I'm not talking some sort of de novo generation. I think we've probably covered enough of this, but all these, but we have the normal form of the protein that all mammals have. It varies from species to species, and even within a species, the precise sequence, and Nick Haley did a wonderful job of summarizing that. And infected animals, we have, in addition to the normal form, we've got this other structure. Um, and I'm in uh, Grateful to Holger Villa for sharing these slides because the structure of the abnormal protein is actually something that has been debated and not easily easy to get at. They think they're getting pretty close, and what I'm showing you on the right seems to be a closer representation. They even have cartoons now and, and that are related to structure and how abnormal form or how normal form stuff in blue actually gets converted onto a abnormal uh, abnormal protein. Well, before I go any farther, it says I'm going to be talking for an hour. Uh, it, it, I'm not going to do that to you guys. But, but, but don't worry. <laughs> Fifteen minutes of my talks seem like an hour, so there's no point going a full hour. Um, so, protease resistant. You've heard discussion of that, but just, just to, to, to clarify, it, it's a way we use to distinguish normal form from abnormal, i.e. a way of identifying an infected animal. If you've got an uninfected animal and you have brain tissue from an uninfected animal, for example, you grind up that tissue, add protease, an enzyme that degrades protein, it degrades the protein, and in that box you see absolutely nothing because that's what happens. It degrades normal form of the protein. This Abnormal form, though, is different. So in an infected animal, you have a combination, both normal form of the protein as well as the abnormally structured form. Add pro K, normal form disappears, but we have this other guy sitting there, and that one can be detected. So it's plus or minus proteinase K, and then how we see the signal in the pro K digestion. And let me give you an example. First of all, we'll start with brain tissue from an uninfected here. And down at the bottom there, you've seen minus or plus PK. In the presence of proteinase K, we see no signal. That's because that animal was uninfected. All it had was normal form of the protein. Here's a Western blot of brain tissue from a clinically infected deer. And what you're seeing there is in the presence of proteinase K, presence of a signal antibody stuff, but basically presence of the signal is black blob, indicating the animal has accumulated abnormal protein, indicating it's infected. 
two other deer. Both of them were preclinical, but both of them have abnormal protein. Less abnormal protein because it was earlier in the disease preclinical stage. You've seen slides similar to this, and as again, this is an emphasis point that the problem with these diseases is that for most of the disease, for most of the infection, the animal appears perfectly, perfectly healthy. I debated whether to show this, because to start talking hamster in a CWD presentation probably doesn't make a lot of sense, but it, it, it I think, shows something um, uh, rather important. And this is a study that uh, Dick Marsh initi initiated probably 25, 25 years ago. Um, it would be an excessively, exp excess excessively expensive experiment nowadays, but basically worked with two strains of hamster agent, infected a bunch of hamsters, and one, one set was high, uh, infected with hyper, one set with drowsy. You're seeing that with hyper and drowsy, infection lengths take longer. It takes a lot longer for animals to come down with drowsy infection. You're seeing with both of them that clinical stage, way at the end, by, at the point where you can look at the hamster and say, hey, there's something wrong. And that for most of the infection, the animals appear perfectly healthy. My point in presenting this is it defined, documents quite nicely the accumulation of abnormal protein during the course of the infection, that we're seeing abnormal protein accumulating at preclinical stage, and we monitored infectivity. You can, you can see infectivity accumulating at preclinical stage. Ergo, at preclinical stage, you have both, you can have high levels of infectivity and uh, high levels, of course, of abnormal, abnormal protein. So, when do infected deer become contagious? Simple answer that I give to most questions people ask me on prion disease and CWD, I don't know. We get really good at saying I don't know. Uh, however, we do know that very early on, lymph tissue becomes positive, within three, as early as three months, one study out of the Hoover lab showed. And we do know that infectivity is released from infected animals in a whole variety of uh, well, either the carcasses or saliva has significant infectivity and as you're well aware at the least clinical stage these animals are drooling messes releasing gallons of, of, of saliva but infectivity can also be found in blood uh, feces urine the problem is that this infectivity, when released into the environment, doesn't degrade, and doesn't degrade well at all. Prions are very difficult to inactivate, very difficult to kill. Um, they're resistant to acids, bases. Uh, you can, under extreme conditions with sodium hydroxide, uh, you want to be careful about a one normal sodium hydroxide bucket in the lab. But at any rate, uh, standard sterilization doesn't inactivate. We go to, when these are not included, this is uh, here's down in the basement of the Freon Center, one of our technicians with one of our autoclaves. We go to extensive um, autoclaving to inactivate. So you combine those two and what do you got? Well, you've got infectious agent shed into the environment and infectious agent that isn't going to degrade readily and will persist and be a source of infection. This is not unique to CWD. We've known about this for sheep scrapes. It's been in the literature for decades now. Um, maybe some of the better studies were done in, in, in Iceland, where sheep were from uh, scrapey infected flocks were removed from pastures. Pastures were kept clear of sheep. Naive sheep brought in and ultimately Develop sheep scrapie. There's one report of 16 years in the incubator, how long the uh, infected area stayed infectious for sheep. Environmental transmission of CWD has been documented in a number of studies. Basically, this is people putting naive deer in pens that once had infected animals, i.e., they'd be exposed to excreta that sort of thing. 
<coughs> so, shed CWD prions, what are they going to interact with? Well, step one is up on the top there, vegetation. <coughs> it gets through that barrier, then it's going to interact with soil. Most of our study has dealt with soils, I'll get to that in a second. Um, you've already heard uh, some of the data already uh, that's been generated looking at binding of prion infectivity to plants and actually take up of a slow level, small levels of infectivity, but take up of prions uh, by plants. Um, our studies on vegetation are trying to get a step ahead of things a little bit. We're, we're certainly anticipating the disease to spread to northern Alberta and into caribou. Um, so we are looking at lichen, reindeer moss, common food of, of caribou, and we're comparing it with prairie vegetation, grass, leaves, that sort of thing. As much as you'd like me to go through step by step on this mess, I'm not going to do it. Let me just say that what we're finding is that prion protein binds better to lichens than it does grass or leaves. Much better to lichens than it does grass or leaves. And I'll be happy to cover questions if you have questions about that later. But very clearly what we're finding is that vegetation can bind prions. Leaves and grass, the, veget the, the uh, binding capacity is low. In those experiments, basically, we just put prion, uh, brain homogenate on leaves and grass and let it rain, i.e. we washed them and then asked the question, is the stuff coming off, yay or nay? And with leaves and grass, much of the infectivity came off. With lichen, less came off, more stuck to the lichen. However, in all cases, we still found prions bound to vegetation. And I'm not showing infectivity data, but we have infectivity data on that as well. So, moving a little deeper into the thing, we're going to talk about soils as a reservoir for CWD prions. Sir? Yeah? What species were you using as an infectivity model for the mice? Oh, those are, yeah, um, all of our. All of our infectivity studies are done in transgenic mice. All of them are done. Now the source of the infectivity we're using in many cases, and I would have to do this experiment by experiment, in many cases are from uh, white-tailed deer or from elk. In some cases, and this is my hesitation on this, in some cases we're using infectivity that we generated from the mouse model. Um, so it, it's kind of a mixture of both, but the infectivity assays, um, are in our transgenic mice. Um, and as I said, from a, from a cost perspective and a numbers perspective, it's really the only option. Servitized uh, mice. mice, yes. Uh, we have, um, as Glenn mentioned, we have um, mice that are more responsive to elk agent. We have some mice that are more responsive to white-tailed deer agent. And so we use a combination depending on what infectious agent we're using, whether it's elk or deer. Thank you for, please, other questions, just please jump in. I, I much prefer that over the standing up here and babbling to you guys. However long it is. Um, soils are exceptionally complex, and I, I, I speak from a, I'm learning about them. I have no formal training as a soil scientist. I link with people who do know soils. In Wisconsin, it was Joel Peterson. Um, here in Edmonton, what I've, what, I, what I've done is basically hired a soil scientist on staff, Al Su Um And put this slide in, goodness, just throw a ton of bullets that really we've already covered. But the most important one is down at the bottom. I just want to emphasize something you guys probably are well aware, that, that servants are soil consumers. Um, they eat a lot of soil, both intentionally as a mineral supplement and unintentionally as part of the, the grazing that's occurring. That mess. Uh, soils vary an awful lot, and this is a soil type differences throughout North America. Um, 
and the characteristics, the differences are relevant, is what I'm going to show you, are, are some differences with soils, uh, tundra, boreal area versus soils of the prairie, and we do get different results comparing the two. Um, if you're used to the U.S. terminology, this stuff isn't going to make sense. I don't know the U.S. terminology as well. I'm more focused at Canada and Europe do use the same terminology. The U.S. being the U.S. has their own. Um, <laughs> I, I'm born and raised in the U.S., so I'm, I'm allowed to say that. Um, so lumisol, podsol, different types of soils, but very similar ones. Northern areas present in, in uh, northern Canada, certainly present in Europe, northern Europe as well. Um, the mineralogy is very different uh, between them and the prairie soils. Illite is the common soil mineral. Illite and illite quartz mixture, common soil minerals with, with those. Um, Trinism is a soil we've looked at a lot, and you can see the areas from the prairie regions. Um, Cambisol, closer to what used to be home in Wisconsin. Um, both Cambisol and Trinism present in, CW, uh, in, in, in large swaths of CWD endemic areas. Uh, Montmorillonite clay is the common clay in those soils. And unfortunately, you're going to hear that term. Um, just the, that circle needs to be expanded as far as where uh, endemic area of CWD is um, in, in, um, in Alberta, but just showing where we've got CWD, where uh, <coughs> some of these soil types, again, tourism is the common soil in the CWD endemic area in Alberta. Anything I need to say here that I haven't already said no, so let's move on. Uh, I think I've emphasized this one. For the northern areas, it's a different mineralogy, and we get a different pattern of interaction of prions with these soils. So soil properties that are relevant, and what we've done is kind of the scientist geeky reductionist approach. Instead of working with whole soils initially, we're working with soil minerals, organics, and we're just getting to the point where we're starting to work with whole soils because we need to figure out what's going on individually to make sense out of this. So um, the first two bullets are kind of where we've been at. Uh, we started with mineralogy. We've done a little more work now on organics. Organomineral complexes <coughs> which occur naturally in the soil and are very, very relevant. We haven't touched those yet and we need to because it questions of plant litter composition, very relevant for um, northern soils because typically the top horizon, soil scientist term, top, top horizon um, for soils there is kind of a, a mushed up plant um, material before you get to what you typically call soil, the soil mineral layer. Oh, and I'm sorry about this slide too, but at any rate, so the experimental approach here is with soil minerals, we take infectious prions, um, brain homogenous, and mix with the soil and get an answer based on prion protein, and then typically we confirm, confirm with animal bioassay as well. This looks horribly complex. It takes months for someone to get good at this, but the basics are really simple. We, be, uh, we, we basically take a soil mineral, add infectious brain homogenate, and ask the question when that soil mineral falls to the bottom of the tube, which it will, does, do the prions come with it? Yes or no? So if it binds, it'll be down in the bottom of the tube in the pellet. If it doesn't bind, it'll be in the supernatant. It sounds simple enough. It took Chris Johnson, a graduate student in my lab at the time, a brilliant graduate student in the lab, months to work this sucker out. Um, and what I want you to look at is, first of all, the quartz sand. And what you're seeing there is we're getting signal in the supernatant. We're not getting it in the pellet, i.e., the prions didn't end up in the pellet. They didn't bind to the quartz sand. Contrast this with this MPE stuff, Montmorillonite clay, a common clay in the prairie, and what we're seeing is an opposite effect with that everything detectable was in the pellet, 
not in the supernatant. The prions bound to the Montmorillonite, and actually, uh, I'm not going to show the experiments, bound exceptionally tightly. So tight that it took us a while to be able to figure out how to get it off of the clay. Not only did it bind <coughs> tighter, but it actually, in, in animal bioassays, and these studies were hamster, um, with hamster agent, in fact, we ended up with something that was slightly more infectious than what we started with. So Montmorillonite bound material was a bit more infectious. Similar result with whole soils, not identical, but with many whole soils, we got an enhancement of infectivity. More recent studies, and um, it's the illite one here and over here, I want you to focus your attention on, as opposed to Montmorillonite clay, which binds, illite tends not to bind. Um, we've done additional studies on that. And again, this is the mineral that's of northern areas, tundra areas, and over in the, the boreal areas as well. Tends not to bind. Um, two other clays, Montmorillonite I've mentioned, illite, I'm sorry, kaolinite, those bind prions. Um, and Montmorillonite quite avidly, avidly, <coughs> illite does not bind very well. Which brings me to the final topic, which has to do with humic acids. And again, this is work by Dr. Elsu Kazitsova. Um, and so this is looking at the organic component of soils, not the minerals anymore, but starting to look organic component of soils. There have been a literature that we've been following where a number of labs had started had looked at or, or, uh, humic acid, and we, we followed up on, on those studies. My point in showing this slide is that we get down at the bottom here, we got different soil types, and we have differing levels of organic. Chernozem, common prairie soil, relatively high levels of humic acid, whereas podzol, brunosol, very low levels. So the amount of organic, the amount of humic acid varies from soil type to soil type as well. Feel free to scribble this one down if you want. Uh, <laughs> uh, at, at any rate, we can purify humic acids from soils. It's kind of an extensive protocol. Um, I can act like I know what I'm talking about. Uh, but it's Al Su who did all this work and came up with the protocol, which is a standard protocol that so soil scientists, uh, soil scientists use. <coughs> Basic approach here, and this is again a test tube reaction. We took brain tissue, added humic acid, let it incubate, and then ask the question, what's going on with prion protein? And then ask the question, what's going on with infectivity? When we looked at lower levels of humic acid, so this would be humic acid levels that would maybe be similar to what was in podzol soils, some of the boreal soils as well, we found no effect. It didn't do anything much to abnormal prion protein, and not surprisingly, it did not much in the animal bioassays. We saw really little impact there. When we increase the amount of humic acid, again, all of these levels are present in different soil types. It varies from soil type to soil type. But what is, I mean, even Judd can figure this out, from, from going from 1 to 25 grams per liter of humic acid, you're seeing a significant decline in, the, in abnormal prion protein. And as I said, okay, sorry, back up one, one other step. We did this also in humic acids. Now, some of the humic acid we work with is commercially available. The previous study I showed you was some stuff off the shelf. Um, Al Su purified humic acids from a number of different uh, Alberta soils, adjusted them all to 20 grams per liter, and compared to this strong, strong signal you're seeing on the far left, you can see the signal was greatly reduced in all of those humic acid signals, and yeah. all those humic acid samples. Yeah, so the humic yep. acid, how does that relate to organic matter? It's, organic it's part of the organic component. It's uh, uh, humic acid, human, 
fulvic acids are all subcomponents of what they call the organic component, which is this degraded vegetation. Right. So um, if I have a higher organic matter soil, will I have a higher organic matter acid? Generally, yes. Um, yes. Any other? Have you ever tested this prior to uh, a fire or a burnout in a certain area, and then afterwards to see if that affects it? How would it? Well, the simple answer is no. My staring at the ceiling is how to how to how to get at it because um, with fire, then you've got a residual burn material as 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 well, and that char does impose different properties to the soil. So I I, I don't know, but it does. It, it, it's a good point. It's a really good it point. Would make it easier, more difficult to update that. I don't know that either. Back to my first point, I mean, when I started, I don't know. I, I, excellent points. I mean, absolutely excellent points. Okay, so we have this combination of stuff that we prepared as well as a standardized humic acid. Importantly, and just confirming what we find when we see the degradation of abnormal protein, is this impacting infectivity? And not surprising, given what we saw in the Western blots and the reduction uh, with increasing levels of humic acid, animal bioassays showed the same thing. As you increase humic acid levels, and this is, again, taking infectious material, incubating with humic acid, different concentrations of humic acid, and then asking the question, what's, what's that doing to, to, uh, to infectivity? Increasing humic acid extends incubation period, and at the extreme levels, you get a lot of animals that just aren't even getting sick for during the almost 300-day incubation period that we let the animals go to. And again, these are in mice, transgenic mice. Um, I will appreciate you to be doing this in a, I can use the term, real animal. But So what have we shown? Well, we've shown that purified humic acids can decrease CWD prion levels. We've shown that purified humic acids can de decrease CWD infectivity. There's a however here, and a big one. I, I'm not at all promoting this yet, i.e., let's use this as a treatment method. I, I think we have to be really um, cautious, and boy, have I gotten emails on this. But at any rate, and one of the bigger bullets, one of the biggest reasons is we don't know what the impact of humic acids on soil-bound prions is. Um, soil bound is a very different thing than the brain homogenate for our initial tests, and we, we know nothing about that. I mean, that's work in progress, but I, I, I can't say enough that this needs to be done um, because we just, we just don't know. Um, I can't even give you the mechanism of how this is happening. Is this a chemical reaction? Is this a biochemical reaction? I, I, I don't know. Clearly, you're very interested in that. Have we optimized the dumb thing? No. We've optimized a few things, but we, we are certainly not convinced that we're, we're, uh, we've got all the criteria worked out on this. And back to the kind of, well, what is it that's in there? Humic acid is, has many components. What exactly is giving us this effect? I don't know. So sort of to summarize our environmental studies, soil and vegetation to date, is that if we're in the boreal or northern areas where we've got an illite mineralogy, where we've got lichens on the ground, shed infectivity there, we're going to see some binding to the lichens and some binding to the vegetation. But once it gets past that, we, we would argue that, that, that infectious agent is going to move through into the soil, not stay at the soil surface, and not be bioavailable. So we kind of got good news and bad news. More of it will bind, but once it gets past that, it will probably not be bioavailable. In prairie regions, we're arguing something quite different. Generally, we're arguing that prions will wash out of the grass, not completely, but will 
It will wash out of the grass. But once there, it's going to stick to the soil because prions bind those clays very, very well and potentially then be a continued source of, of infectivity. <coughs> I want to thank the funding agencies who supported this. Um, Genome Canada, big supporter, as well as the Alberta Crayon Research Institute, uh, University of Alberta groups, and I'm going to thank you guys for your attention. And see if there's any questions. <laughs> The uh, binding to plants that's coming off the animals, did I miss it or was there any research of once it's in the soil that the plants uptake it? There, there was a study a little over a year ago suggesting that it could happen. Now, abnormal prion protein is a large aggregate protein. It, they didn't show a lot of infectivity. I, it clearly can occur. Is it going to be a significant issue? I, I think that it remains to be decided. Just a simple question here. You, you said that on the plant matter that it, it actually washes off and then goes into the soil. And just my impression of you know farms that have been infected that dealing with the prions on anything is hard to get rid of. So, what is actually washing? Is it just rainwater that's it, washing it, it down? Yeah, yeah, correct. That's we used uh, uh, water that had been pH. So it's very similar to rainwater, as, as as close as we could, could get to actual rainwater. And you know, we were doing this in the lab. That's how we have to do these. So we're right down within a, a, the confines there, but but um, yeah, it was rainwater. We just rinsed the leaves, kept the rinse, rinsed them a second time, kept the rinse, and then monitored for abnormal protein and also monitored for infectivity. I have a question. Surprise, surprise. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, being, being that in my past history, I studied soil science. It's surprising what I do remember some days. <laughs> I don't know if I have enough to stand up there. My question is, would be relating to soil pH. Is there any effects there? Because your, your different soils that you're, you're looking at here tend to have yep, yep, a yep, wide yep, variety yep, of pHs yep. and buffering capacity. Oh, absolutely and extremely important. And we are looking at um, examples of different soils within those we haven't worked with whole soils a lot yet. We've worked with some. pH is going to be very, very relevant. I know pH is important for humic acid. I, I just know from some of the optimization we've done that pH is important for humic acid. So different soil pHs would be very relevant. It's a very good comment. One I can't give a great answer to other than we, we, I completely agree and we have started to look at it. for questions. Is there a way you can tell how much is in your soil? Yeah, the, yeah we, the Genome Canada grant is, yeah, and that's a very good question, is there a way of, you know, here's a soil sample, tell us what's there, tell us what's there and how deep it is, um, you know, uh, boy that's beautiful, I, and uh, no, I don't have a way, we are looking into it, we can do this for quartz sand relatively easily because the prions don't bind to quartz sand very well. We could do this very well for northern soils where you've got an elite quartz mineralogy because prions don't bind well to those either. And we, and we know with both of those in soil column studies that I didn't show, prions move through and we detect it in the leachate of material coming through. What gets really messy is the relevant one you're talking about, which is most of the soil types we're dealing with which has a Montmorillonite clay, and that is technically a bitch to do. Um, okay, it, 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 it binds very, very tightly. Trying to get it off is difficult. Therefore, trying to even quantitate it 
is difficult as well. We have not come up with a method for that. We are looking at it, we have funding to do it, but I, I would love to have that answer because that, boy, that would simplify a whole bunch of things and it's a great question with an, an unsatisfactory answer. Thank you. Rich. John, also with uh, the soil samples, uh, for different nutrient levels, especially some of the micronutrients, you know, i.e. copper, you know, over the two provinces, you know, what's, that would be a thing to start looking at. I wonder if we're just not missing a big boat somewhere around there. Wouldn't surprise me. I have nothing to add to that other than, yeah, it's, it's. Uh, but uh, as a researcher, you know, uh, I, I can start well, paying attention to that and see if there's any correlation. Given prions are a metal binding protein, it makes a lot of sense, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, if anybody thinks of anything else, we can catch them in the speaker's panel a little bit later today.